water. It's great to see you all here this morning. Uh, you can go ahead and have a seat. The service is going to look a little bit different this morning than usual, so uh, hang on to your hats as we uh, move uh, from place to place. I think there's a couple of volunteers that were going to come up and help me. Yes, yes, yes. Kayla, come on. So which one of you would like to go first? They have no idea what they're doing, by the way. <laughs> All right, here you go, Lauren. Uh, so, Lauren, could you tell me what this is? A $1 bill. A $1 bill. All right. And, Lauren, if I were to give you this $1 bill, you can, you can hold it, what would you do with it? Put it in my pocket. Uh, okay, and, and what would you do after you put it in your pocket? Don't say forget about it and put it in the wash. Protect it. Protect it. <laughs> all right, all right, fair answer. Kayla, you pass, the, pass the mic, yeah. No, no not, not the dollar. <laughs> you, you, yep, there you go. Kayla, can you tell me what this is? A $20 bill. A $20 bill. And Kayla, if I were to give you this $20 bill, it don't, not so fast. <laughs> What would you do with that twenty dollars? Probably save it. Save it. Mom is shaking her head. No. <laughs> <laughs> you could be truthful. All right. If you weren't going to save it, what, we'll, what would you do with it? Probably gas money. Gas. All right. Or yeah, a new yeah. dress. That's or what? A dress. A dress. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, you can pass pass the mic on. Uh, Anne, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Just, uh, hey, hey! Mine. <laughs> <laughs> if I were to give that to you, what would you do with it? Uh, grocery shop, gas, money. All right, all right. Things like that. Necessary things. All right, now, now give me my money, money back, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yep, yep. All right, you guys are done. Thank you. See, that wasn't so hard, was it? <laughs> All right, so Living Water, how about you? What would you do if you were given some money? Or maybe uh, you have the experience of, you know, putting on a new coat for the winter. You know, this is the time to get out coats. And you put your hand in the pocket, and oh, there's some money in there. What would you do with it? What factors weigh into your decision making on where to spend? Are you uh, a spender who spends only on things that are practical, like gas? Or do you spend on more of on a whim or on out of spontaneity? Or maybe you're, you fall somewhere in between. What motivates you to spend money? See, motivation can be a tricky thing. It's really difficult to de determine because it's really only measurable by external characteristics or external choices of a person. And sometimes I can even have trouble figuring out my own motivation for why I do things. I think it happens on a weekly basis where Amanda will say to me, why did you do that? And I will respond with, I don't know. One thing's for sure, though, each of us makes different choices for different reasons, both in life and in where we spend our money. And today, throughout our service, we're going to be talking about giving styles, about what motivates your giving of money to the church. Now, research shows us that we tend to fall into three different styles of giving, generally speaking. And so, as we go through the rest of the service today, uh, I would task you with trying to see which of these different giving styles you tend to fall into. Or maybe you don't fall into one particular giving style, but you find that you have characteristics or traits from all three. Either way is fine. There's really no right or wrong method of giving. Uh, God has made us all uniquely different 
And so one particular style is not better than another. We are all, however, sinful. And so each giving style needs restoration. Each one has challenges that God's Spirit helps us to overcome. And the goal today is that by seeing how Jesus redeems and restores each of us, that our joy in giving would be multiplied, and through us, God's kingdom would be blessed. So the first giving style that we're going to take a look at is called the family provider. Another word for it is the family first giver. Uh, Family first givers can be, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, family first givers, which is statistically about uh, a little bit over a third of us, uh, will see their first responsibility as providing for their family. Uh, They're motivated by a desire to care for those that they love. Uh, The family first giver uh, tends to give from what is left over after making sure their family is taken care of first. And the strength of a family first giver is in fulfilling God's plan for us. I mean, God gives us families and uh, people that we love and puts us in a position that we are to take care of them. We're supposed to make good choices and good decisions for our family we're supposed to make sure that they're taken care of. We're supposed to provide for them. That's part of what our God-given task is. And so the family first giver excels in this area. On the other hand, family first givers can be challenged by the feeling of, I earned it, it's mine. And when we focus on provision, we can end up feeling proud of our own abilities and leave God's role in caring for us out of the equation entirely. We place the burden and responsibility of our family's well-being on our shoulders rather than leaving room for God to take care of us. When we reach a point in our lives when things get tight or we feel financially stressed, we can become overcome by fear, by the fear of not having enough by the fear of not being able to provide for our family. We can even become suffocated by an overwhelming guilt that we have let our family down. But fear is not where Jesus leaves us. When we fear our ability to provide, he brings us before our loving Father who provides. Our Father who created the world and everything in it. Our Father who cares for this earth and especially for us. Paul reasons this point in his letter to the Romans. He says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? God was willing to give up his own son to save us, and we can be certain that he will care for his needs, for our needs. Jesus himself says in Matthew 6, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus renews our hearts by bringing us back to our Father. Through his blood, we are in the loving care of the creator of the universe, We're set free from the fear of failing to provide because we've been assured assured of God's powerful love and care through Jesus. Not only that, but we are joined together as a family of believers. Paul says in Galatians, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. As family first givers, our motivation for taking care of the family is broadened. From taking care of those to whom we are related by blood into taking care of those to whom we are related by Jesus' blood. We can find joy in supporting the entire family of faith. And so we continue in our worship service this morning by doing just that. We continue by entering into a time of prayer, 
a time where we bring before God the needs of believers, both here in our congregation and around the world. So please join me in prayer. So how many of you have ever uh, moved in your life? Moved somewhere? Yeah, you know, pretty much everybody. Um, In that moving, did you ever have to move furniture? Yeah, yeah, you know, most likely. Uh, Was that a good experience, positive experience? Something you kind of seek out to do on a regular basis? Yeah, no, no, it's it's usually pretty awful. Um, I think most of us share a pretty common bond here uh, in the the dislike of moving furniture. Uh, And fans of the show Friends will recognize the clip that you're about to see. Does that look familiar to anybody? I can't see your responses. It's very, oh, there we go. Yeah, right? I think we've all been there at one time or another in our lives. Uh, moving furniture, especially big, heavy, awkwardly shaped furniture, is not a fun experience. And it's especially not fun if the guy on the other end of the couch has no idea what he's doing. It just ends in smashed toes and shouting and a lot of sweat. If you're a burden sharer, which is our next giving style, dealing with money and giving is remarkably similar to carrying a couch. As burden sharers, we like to do our part as we give. We're motivated by a sense of duty. Burden sharers also like to give to specific ministries and special needs. We like to know that we're part of the team and that our gifts are being used wisely. When things aren't going so well, though, uh, burden sharers can be f- become focused on me, on my own agenda, on what I want to see done. Instead of contributing as a team to get the job done, money can become an instrument of power and even manipulation. We can choose to give only to specific people and specific tasks and withhold gifts from areas that we feel are being mismanaged. When burden sharers encounter division, an us versus them attitude can develop. And we can even start withholding our gifts in order to get revenge. Unlike family first givers who have a fear of not being able to provide, burden sharers are more concerned with making sure that everyone is doing their part of the work. They want to make sure that they're not the only ones carrying the couch. And if they are, they might let go and walk away. And it's only through the death and resurrection of Jesus that the divisions and distrust between us are broken down. When we as burden sharers are faced with division, Jesus gives us the spirit that binds us together. In 1 Corinthians 12, it says, The body is a unit, though made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. And so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greek, slave or free, we were all given one spirit to drink. As it is, there are many parts, but one body. We are each given a unique task in the kingdom of God. We work and act as individual pieces of that body, and that working and acting extends to our giving patterns as well as our perspectives. Just like different people have different ways and motives behind their giving, people also have different ideas about how ministries should be run. As Jesus renews our hearts, we learn that there is unity within diversity, that even when we disagree on how things should be run or on how things should look, 
we share common ground in the end goal, that people would come to know Jesus Christ. Burden sharers find more and more joy in giving as we begin to see what's fair, not as what other people are giving and doing, but what God has given and done for us. Not only that, but, bur- but burden sharers find joy in seeing how our gifts are being used for God's kingdom. By the way, did you guys hear about the 70 plus middle and high schoolers that spent a week over the summer serving our local communities? Or maybe you've heard about how our confirmation process is helping to grow families in their discipleship walk. Or maybe you heard about in September when we reached out to over 250 people in the Whitmore Lake and surrounding communities with an absolutely incredible kids' day. Or maybe you've noticed that the rent is paid and we continue to worship in this space here at Whitmore Lake High School. Or even in the opportunity our youth had both last week and this Sunday after the service in serving people in need, both at Family of God in Detroit and at Latino Mission this afternoon in Lansing. But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop with just the things that we've done, but the things that are coming up. As I look at the announcements for today, uh, there is Advent by Candlelight coming, an opportunity to reach out and invite those uh, whom we love or whom we know to come hear a message of hope and peace about Christmas. There's an Israel trip coming up in the spring, an opportunity to go and experience the Holy Land. And by the way, if you're interested in going on that trip, there's a meeting coming up on November 23rd at 4 p.m. at the Flynn's. Or even in celebrating life and life after death. Uh, As you may have heard, uh, this past week, David Knox has passed away. And we mourn with the Knox family. But we also celebrate the new life that David has in Christ. A celebration that's going to take place this Thursday at 11. We can all share in the joy of what our congregation is doing in the lives of real people. We can be excited about how our gifts are being used to bring the good news of Jesus to those who need to hear it, and to those who need a helping hand. We can even be excited about the opportunities we have to give to specific needs in our congregation. And so as we think about those needs and those gifts and those things that we have going on and coming up in our congregation, we continue in worship with a time of offering, a time to give those gifts. So back at the beginning of the service, I had a few people on stage and asked them what they would do uh, with a certain amount of money. Now, if uh, one of those people had decided to say, uh, well, I'm going to give 10 cents of this dollar to the church, uh, or had decided to say, uh, I'm going to give $10 of this $20 bill to the church, they would have fallen into our final giving style, which is called the first fruits giver. First fruits givers are people that give a percentage of money right off the top of whatever you receive. Uh, and first fruits givers have a number of things going for them uh, regular, consistent, and even automatic giving, uh, and trust in God's ability to provide and even sometimes a level of sacrifice. However, first fruits givers can also end up giving kind of mindlessly. The act of giving can become a heartless exercise done out of obligation and maybe even resentment. It can become routine to the extent that we are completely unaware that it is even happening. Giving can become a budget line item instead of an expression and a relationship of trust. For the ancient Israelites, God developed that relationship of trust 
by a personal act of salvation. He led them out of Egypt as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night. He dwelt in the tabernacle in a physical way among the people. He even appeared directly to Moses, an experience that caused Moses' face to shine in such a way that the people were completely terrified of him. And out of this personal relationship, this personal physical interaction, the people gave their first fruits as is recorded in Deuteronomy. It says, Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. With great terror and miraculous signs and wonders, he brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now... I bring the first fruits of the soil that you, O Lord, have given me. Like the people of Israel, our giving is based in God's saving work in our lives. It is based in the saving work of Jesus on the cross. It is based in his death and resurrection for you and for me. It is based on Jesus' sacrifice for our sins. And we have the blessing of experiencing his physical presence as we come to communion. We have the encouragement of coming before God and before one another in confession and hearing the words of forgiveness proclaimed, words that break through our hardened hearts and restore our worship. Jesus breaks through the routine of the first roots giver by giving us himself. At the heart of all of our giving, regardless of our giving style, is relationship. Our loving and relational God has come to us in our sin and our hopelessness, in our fear and our failure, in our brokenness and our division, in our heartlessness and our apathy. He came to redeem us and make us new. As we are transformed and renewed by God's Spirit, we aren't conformed into robots. God doesn't take away the things that make us unique. Instead, he takes us in our different and varied ways of giving, in the ways we are wired, and he consecrates us to himself, renewing and restoring our sinfulness and giving us a unique place and role in his kingdom. Our giving is centered in relationship, the relationship of a loving God coming to redeem his people. As Paul explains in Romans, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God is at work in our lives, transforming each of us. Through Jesus, we have been made new. And through God's Spirit, we are continually being formed into his likeness. As kingdom workers and as givers, our roles and ideas may be different. Our challenges and our needs may be different. But we are all renewed by the same love and the same Spirit that brings us forgiveness and eternal life. And so we come then before God's throne and gather together as his people and his church to confess our sins. We come as fearful people with broken relationships and broken hearts. And so we come together and confess responsibly.